We're going to call this video Kidnapped and Taken to a Teenage Boot Camp or a Teen Boot Camp. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you guys in today's video my story of uh, being kidnapped out of my house in the middle of the night. Kidnapped might be like a little bit of a dramatic word because I wasn't kidnapped by strangers. Uh, my parents had organized for this kind of teen transport uh, company. Uh, to transport me from my house to one of these teen boot camps, behavior modification schools, uh, you know, wilderness boarding squadron, which you, which you kind of want to refer to these as. Um, but I wound up spending, I think it was eight or nine months there. I was out in, uh, Thompson Falls, Montana. The, uh, the name of the, uh, uh, facility was called Spring Creek Lodge. Uh, they, you know, you kind of did, uh, I forget the name of it, but you know, kind of where you go to school yourself, uh, go to school, um, you know, we'd go sit in a classroom, but you kind of had your own books. Uh, it was kind of correspondence through the mail and, you know, the quote unquote school, uh, which later turned out to be unaccredited. And a lot of people, you know, didn't wind up graduating high school or couldn't wind up getting into college with their, uh, you know, high school experience, which is kind of ironic seeing as how most people's parents sent them there. Uh, to finish school, but the school wasn't accredited. So a lot of people had trouble going out to, on to co college. But the, uh, the school was actually called Spring Creek Academy. Um, and so I'm just going to be kind of sharing my story of my nine months there with you guys. And I think we're going to start the, the first video off uh, just kind of telling my story about how I wound up there, how I was taken out of my house in the middle of the night, uh, flown with these two transporter guys, uh, one who uh, later turned out, or I later learned, um, was basically a disgraced former Atlanta cop, uh, had beat his wife, diddled his daughter, um, and now he was in the, the business of transporting teens uh, to WASP specialty programs. And, and you know, I was in uh, Spring Creek Lodge, uh, again, Thompson Falls, Montana, but they, they were run by these two brothers. I believe their name was Culkins. And uh, the, the facility was located in uh, Thompson Falls, Montana, but they ran facilities all over the world. Uh, there was one in Utah called Cross Creek. And maybe some of you guys, you know, I imagine a lot of the people watching this video, some people may just stumble upon it and maybe you have an interest in this. Maybe you're thinking about sending your kids to one of these schools, uh, if you want to call it a school. Um, but I'm guessing a lot of people who are going to wind up watching this video are, are you know, kids or now grown ups, now young adults who at one time were in these schools. So maybe you were in some of the schools that I'm mentioning. Uh, I know one was called Cross Creek. It was in uh, Utah. Um, there was another one called, uh, there, there were two, uh, two out of the country. One, there were more than two out of the country, but the two I'm thinking of, there was one in Jamaica, uh, kind of on the bottom, uh, the South, the South side of Jamaica, uh, South side of the Island called, it was either like Tranquility Bay or Paradise Cove. And then there was another one in Samoa. It's kind of crazy that somebody would send their kid across the world to Samoa. Uh, but there was another one in Samoa and I'm getting the names of these mixed up, but you know, both of these, one of these was called like something like Tranquility Bay and the other one was called like Paradise Cove. Uh, I believe Primetime or 2020 did a series about these probably back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I want to say late 90s because I think I remember seeing one of these series prior to me even going to one of these places. And uh, the ones out of the country, what's kind of crazy about this is... Uh, you know, think about it, like in the U.S., we have, you know, child protective services and even they kind of fall short and don't do enough. And there's a lot of kids who are neglected and abused and everything else. But imagine outside of the country where there's no oversight whatsoever, um, the things that go on there. And that was kind of one of the threats all the time. Uh, you know, I, I was in Spring Creek Lodge in Thompson Falls, Montana, but that was kind of one of the threats. If you misbehaved, if you tried to run, uh, run away, they would send you to one of these outside of the country. I know there was another one in Mexico and at the ones outside of the country, I mean, it was really anything goes. I know in, uh, in Samoa, which eventually got shut down and I wound up living with and going to school with a lot of the, uh, the kids who were at the one in Samoa that got shut down. I mean, everybody was covered in, in boils and things like that because of the living conditions. Um, you know, they lived in an unheated kind of open air, you know, area on mats. There was no schooling. Uh, they'd get beat. If you misbehaved, you'd be hogtied and beaten and thrown into like a dark room, uh, for anywhere from hours to days on end. Um, and then at the one in Jamaica, I know a lot of kids got beaten, things like that as well. At the one in Mexico, they used to have them do stupid things like run rocks back and forth, you know, run piles of rocks back and forth. 
um, not give him any food. I, I think one kid wound up dying of heat exhaustion from being kind of kept in essentially a dog cage outside. Uh, and I think later there was one in Czech Republic too. I, I know there's probably many more than these. Uh, they tend to be in rural areas or outside of the country where there's not really much oversight over what goes on. Um, no one's in, in kind of small communities and things like that. You know, this whole thing is kind of billed as, you know, teen therapy, get your teen back on track. But you got to keep in mind, I mean, they're putting these things in these rural, rural areas uh, where the local population, you know, isn't necessarily college educated. It provides jobs for the community. But I mean, the people you have, you know, quote unquote, counseling kids, being the teachers to kids, um, you know, being the staff or security that makes sure that we don't leave. These are just, you know, I don't mean to talk down because there were some good people there. But I mean, these are for the most part, just kind of hillbillies who got one of the only jobs in uh, in this city. And, you know, the the lady who ran the place and cooked uh, or who ran the kitchen and cooked, you know, her husband was one of the staff and her son was one of the teachers. And then they're also, I think the Culkins were somehow Mormons or something like that. Cause I know there'd be a lot of people cycling in and out who I think were on those like Mormon missions. I think when Mormons turn what, like 17, 18, 19, 20, something like that, they go on a mission and do some type of service work. A lot of them go out of the country, but I think a lot of them wound up working at these camps as well. And there was a lot of, uh, kind of carryover in terms of how these camps were run that kind of had to do with, uh, Mormons. Yeah, I wouldn't say, re- uh, I don't know. I was going to say, I wouldn't say religion was like directly tied in, but I mean, we weren't allowed to have caffeine. Um, they'd play these like motivational and self help tapes, you know, while we ate and things like that. And I do think kind of the Mormon religion kind of crossed over into, you know, kind of how they ran the place, how they quote unquote raised us since they were, you know, essentially uh, taking taking the place of our parents and, and kind of raising us. And uh, it was it was kind of a crazy experience. I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background about WASP, Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs. Uh, again, if you Google it, YouTube it, there's uh, you'll probably find some YouTube videos from... Uh, you know, primetime 2020 and Dateline and, and, and all these types of shows. Um, and I think there have been a couple documentaries about this. There's a, uh, a website called Wasp Survivors where a lot of pe- other people kind of share their stories like I'm doing right now. Um, and so I just want to give you guys a little bit of background, but here's kind of how everything kicked off. Um, so I was 16 years old, uh, you know, probably middle class, upper middle class home. Uh, I don't think I was a horrible kid, um, but, you know, I was rebellious, smoked weed, uh, partied, stayed out too late, you know, maybe ran away a couple times. Um, one of those things where if I looked at me on a piece of paper, I would probably, and I didn't know it was me and I'm just talking about another kid. I would say, oh, that kid's probably pretty bad. Uh, but knowing it's me, you know, I I felt like I was always a a good person. I just kind of felt like I was a rebellious teen. And honestly, most of my friends were pretty rebellious too. I would say worse than me. And none of them wound up going away to camps or boarding schools like this. And all of them wound up having, uh, you know, successful lives. I don't really keep in touch with any of them anymore, but I know one went on to become a lawyer. Um, another guy's a chiropractor another kid's a cop um and and so you know i guess kind of my point in saying that is even had i not gone to the school i I think i probably would have wound up okay i had parents who were a little bit stricter i was a a first child uh which i think parents tend to overreact over things like that you know i think when you're the second kid the third kid you know your your parents have caught the kids drinking before caught them staying out too late caught them smoking a little bit of weed it's less of a big deal but i remember the first time my parents like caught me smoking weed or realized i was smoking weed they were like crying and it was like the biggest deal in the world um and so i guess kind of my point in saying this i think parents maybe overreact a little bit for the first kid my parents might have been a little bit overly strict with me so that's a little bit of background on kind of me um so one night I had my first day of work at McDonald's and uh, I remember I get home from McDonald's, you know, first day of work, wound up uh, eating dinner, watching a little bit of TV and, you know, probably around 10 o'clock, go upstairs to uh, to go to bed, you know, at school the next day. And so I wake up at must be, I'm guessing probably three thirty four in the morning, my light turns on. And I think I briefly saw maybe my parents poke their heads into the room. And then next thing I know, there's two guys in ski caps standing in my room. Two guys, probably about 45 plus, 50 plus. Uh, one guy's a black guy, uh, ski cap. The other guy is an older, older white guy, 50 something white guy, ski cap. And, uh, you know, I'm groggy. I'm just waking up, I wake up at three in the morning, the lights on two strangers in my room, like what the hell's going on. And they both announced that they're Atlanta cops. Now, uh, again, I think the, I think maybe that's kind of what they, uh, you know, kind of a side job for them is, is transporting teens. Um, so I think they tell me they're taking me to a boarding school or something like that. I really didn't get much of an explanation. 
uh, I say I have to go to the bathroom, and uh, I think I'm, if if I remember correctly, I, I'm planning on like literally jumping out the bathroom window. I'm thinking they're gonna let me go in the bathroom by myself. I'm gonna jump out the window. It's like February or something like that. So I mean, it's snowing. Uh, there's snow on the ground. It's cold as hell. But I'm thinking I'm gonna jump out the. You know, I'm gonna go second store. Uh, second story upstairs bathroom, but I'm going to jump out the bathroom, try to maybe run over to one of my friend's houses and, uh, you know, just kind of stay with a friend or something like that. Uh, well, of course, they wind up coming into the bathroom with me. They're like each holding my arm like as I'm peeing. Uh, so I wound up getting a pair of uh, jeans on. I think like no underwear, just throw on a pair of jeans, uh, throw on a wife beater. Uh, I don't even think I got like shoes or socks. Maybe I was able to like half cram into a pair of shoes, uh, but they take me out to uh out to my driveway and put me in uh, i think i remember it was a uh chevy uh not a chevy celebrity i don't know like, you know like a 90s chevy something like that and uh they're taking me to midway airport i didn't really know exactly where we were going i think we, i did know we were going to the airport and i don't know about you guys but you know when you're a, a kid or a teenager i, I think I, either i hadn't been driving long or didn't drive and so like even something across town feels like really far from you and really kind of foreign. And so now I'm like, you know, Midway is kind of like not technically Chicago, but like south southwest side of Chicago type thing. So we're driving and it just everything seems so foreign. It's the middle of the night. It's dark out. It's gloomy. It's like sleeting and snowy and kind of rainy and things like that. And I think the one guy was sitting in the back seat with me. The, the other guy was driving. So uh, I'm thinking about like jumping out of the car, but they have the doors locked. There's no way I can do that. And I'm kind of realizing the further I get away from home, from my hometown, the, the harder it is for me gonna, to, you know, to, to get away essentially. So we wind up getting to, uh, Midway airport. And you got to remember, this is like pre, uh, 2001. So there's really not airport security. I think at that time people could like walk to the gate with other people. So it's not like we had to go through all the security and there's lines and things like that. I'm handcuffed. Uh, I forget at what point they handcuffed me, but I am handcuffed. So there's like a little bit of security. It's literally just like a lady with a wand. I don't even think most people had to go through there. Uh, but because I had handcuffs on, I couldn't go through the metal detector. So uh, I wind up having to get wanded down. I got like, I don't know if I got no shirt on or I got a wife beater on. My pants are like falling down. Um, you know, at this point, it's probably five o'clock, six o'clock. So you have like all the business people traveling through the airport. And here I am just kind of looking ridiculous. Uh, so we wind up getting into the gate. I remember once it comes time to board the plane, uh, they kind of say to me, they're like, look, you know, we don't want to embarrass you. We don't want to bring you on here with in handcuffs. Like if you promise to behave yourself and not cause a scene, we'll uh, we'll take the handcuffs off you. So we wind up getting on the plane. I remember we're sitting there. And uh, at that point, one of the guys kind of gave me like a little brief, uh, I don't know if you want to say pep talk or, or, you know, probably just trying to get me to be calm and kind of go with the program. But they're like, oh, you look, you, you know, you're going to go to, uh, you know, some kind of teen counseling camp type thing. Uh, just going to be for a couple of weeks. It's, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, this, that, and the other. And, uh, you know, I, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I don't know what the hell is going on. But I, I think at one point I, I kind of started relaxing just a little bit um, just because, you know, it's not like kids in my school hadn't gone to rehab or hadn't gone to, you know, various facilities like this. And being from, uh, you know, upper middle class area, like, you know, you'd heard stories. And most of the time it was like, you know, someone kind of goes to some ritzy uh you know, teen boarding school thing, like it's co-ed, uh, people are kind of sneaking around, you know, hooking up with girls and it's, you know, it's not fun. You don't want to be there, but it's, you know, not what, what I was actually in for, um, for the next, you know, eight, nine months of my life, whatever. So I, I think I'd kind of resigned myself a little bit to like, ah, you know what, this thing's going to be like two or three weeks, you know, when you're a kid, that seems like an eternity, but uh, you know, I, I can kind of get past this, whatever, we'll kind of go with the program. So I remember we uh, we land in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, get our bags, whatever else, and we had uh, a couple hours of a layover before we were continuing on it. You know, you got to keep in mind at this point, I don't know where we're continuing on to, uh, but there's a couple hour layover, so we wind up getting breakfast at Chili's. You know, I know Chili's normally doesn't serve breakfast, but I guess in airports, uh, pretty much everyone serves you know all meals because it's really the only places in there. So we eat breakfast at Chili's. Not really hungry, but I kind of realized this is probably the last decent meal I'm going to get for a while. Uh, so I wind up eating. Next flight, we get on the flight. I don't really remember too much about like how much they were talking to me, what went on. I do recall having the thought that, like, you know, should I try to get away? Should I try to run out into the parking lot? Um, and I used to live in Minneapolis when I was a kid. I uh, didn't really, 
you know, I probably still had some childhood friends there, but like, you got to keep in mind, this is pre cell phone days. I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a wallet on me. Like if I run away, what am I going to do? Like, I'm basically going to go be a street kid with one pair of clothes. Um, so the thought crossed my mind, but never really made a getaway. So anyhow, we continue on. We, uh, we land in Spokane, Washington. I remember Spokane, Washington's airport being kind of crazy to me. You know, I've hadn't done a ton of traveling. You know, I know what Midway airport, no hair airport looks like, but like Spokane Airport was pretty crazy. I remember like the whole roof of the place was glass. I remember it was really kind of gloomy and rainy and hazy. Um, and we wind up going there. They wind up getting a, a rental car. Um, and we just wind up driving off. And, and so we're leaving out of Spokane, Washington. I'm paying attention to street signs and things like that. But I'm just noticing like the longer and longer we drive, it's just getting more rural and more rural and more rural. And uh I assume I, I realized that we crossed over into Montana. We're in the middle of nowhere, uh, driving forever, driving forever. If, you know, at this point, it's it's probably close to getting dark out. And I remember us turning off of not even a major highway or anything like that, but some type of like interstate or what you could call a highway and just being on like gravel roads. And it was still, I want to say, like hours of driving. And uh, at this point, it's kind of starting to get dark. And eventually... Uh, at this point, I'm exhausted. You know, I've been up since three thirty, four in the morning. I've I've been on two different flights. We've been driving for hours. And uh, at this point, I remember we pull up to kind of like a clearing in the woods, I and mean, we we are in the middle of nowhere. Like, haven't hasn't been like a street light in like fifty miles. And uh, there's a little single wide trailer run down, kind of on the side, and then I see a couple cabins, and that's kind of actually what you're looking at right now. Uh, is the cabins. Um, the cabins had were basically broken up into four quadrants. There was an upstairs and a downstairs. You couldn't get upstairs from downstairs or vice versa. Uh, so you, you can probably see on that first building on the left, you would walk up a staircase to get to the upper left. Now, the two sides of the upstairs and the two sides of the downstairs connected but had a dividing door, kind of like a hotel room. Uh, along the back wall, there was a bathroom with maybe three or four toilets and maybe five showers. Um, and that's what every one of these you know, four areas uh, were and then uh, the room was basically a big open room with bunk beds uh, all around the, the perimeter of the room and then everybody had like uh, a laundry basket everybody was allowed to have one laundry basket full of clothes and you know notebooks and whatever else you had uh, under the bed I'm getting a little bit a ahead of myself here uh, but we pull up into this parking lot I remember the first guy who comes out I later learned his name was Culkin and uh, he was an asshole. At one point, uh, I mean, we'll get into a lot of these stories later. At one point, uh, he tipped over a kid in a porta potty in the middle of winter, and the kid was covered in that, you know, poo and that blue sludge and pee. Um, at another, I think he eventually wound up. He beat up a bunch of kids. He eventually wound up getting let go uh, because he was having sex with uh, an underage girl on the girl side of the facility. So there were girls and guys here, but everything was kept completely separate. You didn't eat together in the dining hall. Uh, you didn't have classes together. If at any time you guys were anywhere near each other on the property, like passing, uh, going to school or going to the cafeteria, uh, you know the the leaders of the staff would say something like heads down to the left and everyone would have to look down to the left and you know the girls leader would say heads down to the right and everybody would look to the right and you weren't even allowed to look at each other um but uh this Culkin guy winds up coming out and you know i think right off the bat kind of like rubs me the wrong way it's kind of like oh don't don't try to escape you little shithead you know there's not a, a traffic light within 50 miles and there's bears and mountain lions out here and uh this that and the other uh, so they wind up taking me into this double wide trailer, I think doing some type of like intake thing, uh, take some info from me, uh, fill out some forms. You know, at this point, it's it's later in the evening. Uh, it's dark out. Um, I remember they threw they, they made me go to a shower and threw a bunch of uh, like lie or something like that on me, uh, you know, kind of hosed me off. And uh, at that point, I hadn't eaten all day. So they were like, oh, take him to the, the cafeteria, get him something to eat. So I wound up going to the cafeteria. Um, at this point, you know, the meal service has been over the, uh, you know, when you, it's kind of like prison where people like work the kitchen. So they take me to the cafeteria. And I think the three or four guys, kids, uh, boys working the kitchen. And then there's, there was this lady, I remember her name was Gloria. And she was kind of uh, she was kind of like a grandmotherly kind of figure. She was actually a really good person, really nice lady. 
Um, and it was kind of like you kind of wanted to work the kitchen because you didn't have to go to school. You didn't have to deal with any of the other nonsense. She would let you listen to the radio. And we never had radio or anything like that. You never had radio, never had TV. Uh, so it was like really weird to be able to actually listen to music. And then you could eat anything you wanted while you were working in the kitchen. You could have cereal. You could make yourself no-bake cookies and things like that. It was uh, it was really kind of a treat. But uh, they wind up uh, giving me some of the you know the cold food or whatever from earlier um, I want to say there was some mac and cheese and a sandwich or something like that. The food was really terrible there, but again, we'll get into that later as well. Um, and so I remember I wasn't hungry at all. The food was terrible. I could barely eat anything, but I tried to get something into my stomach. And then they wind up taking me over to my quote unquote family. So, uh, I mean, I, I would almost call them cell blocks, but each, uh, the cell block essentially was called a family and your family would have a name. It was like quest or Trinity or loyalty, you know, names like that. And, uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, I think I was in that building on the far left of this photo. If not the far left, it was the next one in. Um, and I was in the upper left room. So basically that staircase that you're looking at right there, I was basically in that room there. So we walk up there um across the property and we you know they have to unlock the door there's like a 2000 pound magnetic door and i go and i remember the uh the the family father as they called him basically guard uh his name was roy he was actually a decent guy as well um but they kind of introduced me to him uh they take my shoes from me and there's like a lock box so basically picture like a big treasure chest type thing with like individual slots for people's shoes and they would lock everybody's shoes up at night so that you couldn't get your shoes and, and try to break out and run away. And I remember there were guys all around the room, um, you know, kind of getting ready for bed, writing letters, doing push-ups, things like that. And I just remember thinking, like, man, I am out of my fucking element. I have no idea where I'm at. I have no idea if these kids are going to beat me up, like if they're better than I am. Uh, what's going on? Um, and they kind of assigned me to... Uh, you know, they kind of assigned me a kid to be kind of my buddy to kind of get me going and teach me the rules and things like that. He was from uh, Maryland. Um, nice enough kid. I remember he was showing me some of his stab wounds. Uh, you know, Philly's kind of a rough... Or was it Philly? I think it was Philly. Yeah, but Philly's kind of a rough city. Um, and, you know, he's showing me his stab wounds and kind of telling me some kind of war stories and things like that and how long he's been there. And I'm kind of trying to get a, a grip on, like, what is this place I'm at? How long do people stay here for? What goes on here? And I think he's kind of explaining a little bit to me. Uh, there was another kid I met. Uh, we'll call him Lacey. And uh, he was he was a, a good kid. He was uh, very naive, very young, very not street smart, but a nice kid. I don't think he's really somebody who should have been there and necessarily deserved to be there. Um and he was just a really nice kid. I remember he gave me a Bible and uh, told me, you know, when someone new comes and, you know, they don't know what the hell's going on, he gives them this Bible and everyone has signed it. So he gives me that Bible and, it, you know, he's kind of buddying up to me. Uh, there was another kid, Eddie. Uh, the rumor was his dad was like the CEO of BET. I don't know if that's true. He was a, a black dude, really tall, really good at basketball. Uh, seemed to be kind of a, a leader of the place and a little bit more sure of himself talked to him a little bit. And I think I kind of slowly got to know everybody uh, that evening a little bit. Uh, they were all curious to, you know, I would later kind of learn, but you really have no tie to the outside. We're not getting magazines. We're not getting newspapers. There's no internet. Uh, we're not watching TV. We're not listening to the radio. So the outside world is like so far away and separate from you. Um, and so they're asking me like about music and movies and sports and basically almost kind of trying to use me to kind of catch up on the world. Uh, and you know, later I would kind of learn how the days are structured and things like that. But basically this is kind of like at the very end of the day, uh, they've all kind of done their chores. They've all cleaned up the room, cleaned up the bathroom. And you maybe have like a half hour or an hour when you can write letters, read a book, uh, you know, fold your laundry, take care of your stuff. Um, you know, write a letter home, whatever else. So that's kind of their time there. Some people are taking showers, getting ready for bed and, None of my stuff had, had arrived, right? Because I, I just traveled with the clothes on my back. I guess my parents had previously sent stuff there, were sending stuff there. But all of a sudden now, it's it's time for bed. Uh, it was a little bit comforting having some kids to talk to and things like that. But at this point, lights go out, no talking. Uh, there's kind of a guard guy who sits in the middle of the doorway that divides these two rooms. And everybody goes to bed. And I'm on the upper bunk. Um, got a dirty mattress, you know, dirty, thin mattress. 
and uh, my clothes are wet from trucking through the snow and getting rained on and everything else. Uh, I don't have any pajamas. I don't have any sweatpants or anything like that. So I remember I'm in a, a wet pair of jeans. Uh, my socks are wet and like a t-shirt. I got no blanket, no pillow. And I remember that first night just freezing cold, super uncomfortable because I'm all wet, no pillow, no blanket, and, and just laying on uh, that mattress. I remember kind of quietly kind of crying to myself. And I think I actually did manage to eventually fall. You know, I remember sitting up for a long time thinking, what the hell is going on? What have I gotten myself into? Uh, but at some point, the lights do wind up, uh, or I'm sorry, at some point, I do wind up falling asleep. I think I was just kind of so exhausted from the day and stressed out and everything else that I do wind up falling asleep. And uh, I think that's where we will end today's video. Um I have a lot of like stories and, and memories of certain days, certain events, funny stories, things like that. But in terms of like what my first day was like there, I, I kind of vaguely remember. So uh, we will kind of keep up with this series. I'll share some more videos with you guys. I, I might try to kind of chronologically go through my story and then kind of go back and just share some, some funny stories or messed up things or whatever else. Uh, but I think that's where we will leave off for today. So, uh, if you guys found this video to be entertaining, informative, interesting, uh, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you're uh, if you're not subscribed to, to, to this channel and you want to hear more of this story, uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button below. Uh, but that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, stay tuned, subscribe, and uh, I'll, I'll be continuing this story and uh, more stories about uh, my experience in the WASP program and Spring Creek uh, Spring Creek Lodge with you guys in future videos. Later.